السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وشفيعنا وقائدنا وقرة عيوننا سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا يا أرحم الراحمين Today inshallah we will talk about رفيدة الأسلامية رضي الله عنها and ويس القرني رضي الله عنها So when سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم migrated and arrived in Medina, the female companions rushed to serve him. And uh, they were so happy to have him uh, in their community. So his love filled their hearts. His love uh, uh, directed their hearts. And they felt the change in their lives when Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to them. So some of these uh, female companions uh, wanted to uh, uh, g- give her house for Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, others wa- uh, would uh, cook food for Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, other companions used to uh, uh, seek knowledge and to learn the Quran, to learn the Quran and to teach the Quran. Um, most of them would participate in battles with Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we have a name today, Rufayd al Aslamiya. Rufayda al Aslamiya was uh, a strong, independent woman. And she was among the first people in Medina to accept Islam. So, Rufayda is widely recognized as the female nurse and surgeon in Islam. She was uh, always helping her dad. He was a physician and uh, she wanted to, to be someone who can do something remarkable for Islam. And of course, uh, we mentioned that she accepted Islam early And she was one of the Ansar women who who wanted to please Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So many many accounts of her life describe her as notably kind, patient, empathetic, uh, all of which shine through through, uh, Rufayda's consistent act of service. Rufayda radiallahu anha began her path in medicine by learning, as I mentioned, from uh, uh, from her dad and assisting him. He was Sa'd al Aslami, he was a physician, and she was specially known. Uh, for stabilizing patients and uh, ensuring their proper hygiene in preparation for more imp- uh, for more uh, invasive procedures. So she was helping her dad. And she provided expert level care while continuously refining and broadening her skills through hands-on field work. So eventually, being so skilled, Rufayda radiallahu anha courageously took her expertise to the battlefield and she cared for 
the injured soldiers. She cared to uh, to help them. She cared to uh, um, uh, attend their their wounds. So she she cared for the injured uh, soldiers during the battles with uh, uh, against the non-believers, and that was including the Battle of Al Khandaq and the Battle of Khaybar. So Rufaida also took it upon herself to share her knowledge and to teach other women to work in medicine. So uh, she radiallahu anha, was able to provide hands-on training to women looking for, uh, looking to help uh, provide aid to the sick and to the wounded people. Uh, and uh, she was then able uh, to organize an invaluable network of nurses, many of which followed her uh, they, and they joined her in treating casualties of battles. So what happened at the end of the Battle of Khaybar? At that time, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was so impressed with Rufayda radiallahu anha. He was so impressed with her medical and nursing work uh, that he assigned her a share of the bounty equivalent to that of the soldier's share. Now imagine being recognized and empowered and encouraged by the greatest of mankind. So once, once the war and the battle came to an end, she was permitted by the Prophet وسلم, to maintain what she was essentially, uh, uh, what, she, um, uh, um, what, what she made or what she worked on, which was essentially a small clinic in a tent situated in Masjid al-Nabawi. So this allowed Rufayda radiallahu anha to continue providing the medical care and to attain more women and to train them, to train these women as nurses. Rufayda radiallahu anha, her, her uh, uh, unwavering de devotion for, to caring for others was remarkable. And when she wasn't working as a nurse, what did, she, what did she do? She used to pursue her social work. And uh, uh, she was a social worker. And she advocated for the Muslims in need. So she served her community while serving her faith. Now, uh, the, the name of Rufayda radiallahu anha was so remarkable, was so br brilliant in the Khandaq uh, battle. Uh, when Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'az was, uh, was uh, injured, his injury was severe, and Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, asked the companions to move him to the tent of uh, Rufayda. Uh, that uh, and uh, so, so so that she would take care of him and she would uh, she would care of his wounds. So uh, and his words were very uh, precise. He said, "Rodiyallahu an, ijaluhu fi khaymati rufayda hatta aoudahu min qarib. Send him to the." Uh, to the uh, tent of Rufayda until I come and visit him. So Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had so much faith. He trusted the care of Rufayda radiallahu anha and he trusted her skills in medicine. So her, uh, her tent was close to the houses of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that made it easy for Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to come and check on Sa'ad. So if 
Now, now, let's stop for a second and ask ourselves: If someone, if someone comes and asked us for help, so what would that have in our heart? Some people would say, "Oh, why me? There are so many people. Why, why, why those people chose me for help?" Rufaida was not like that. Rufaida had in mind. She took up on herself to serve her to serve her community, to help her community, and she felt how. And what it means when Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, من فرج عن مسلم قربة whoever, whoever helps a person in any affliction of this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> will help him in the day after. And this is what was in the heart of Rufayda radiallahu anha. So she wanted to help people so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would take care of her in the day of judgment. She did that out of love to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when you see how, how uh, Rufayda was doing her work, you see all the ihsan. You see all the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see all the love and all the compassion in believing what she is doing. It's the khair for the ummah. It's the khair that, that would be shared by everyone. So her ihsan and her doing her duty in the most possible and uh, best way that she can do was her title. This is a lesson for us. Whatever your job is, do it with ihsan. Do it with as much, uh, as, as best as you can do. Why? What is Al-Ihsan? Al-Ihsan an ta'abud Allah ka'annaka tarah fa'in lam takun tarah fa'innahu yarak. So Ihsan is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you are seeing him. But if you are not seeing him, he is seeing you. So he is watching over what you are doing. Do everything with Ihsan. So the aim of this series that we have started is to urge women to be productive. And women have the capabilities to impact this world, to help, to care, to serve. And they can do so by imitating those female companions who had, who had the, uh, the blessings of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to what they were doing. So for Rufayda, she would she is she is the 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 one who is taking care of the wounds, the the nurse. She is the surgeon. She is, and all of that was just a help to this to her world. So women can fo follow the footsteps of the female companions and be guided by the light by their light and by the legacy they left. So we have to be, uh, uh, we have to be proud of these female companions and we have to be in their footsteps. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have his mercy upon Rufayda who was the best Muslim nurse. So this was a kind, a empathetic nurse. So she helped and she trained others to be like her. So everyone would, would help this society. So 
This is one of our uh, female companions who was uh, one of a remarkable ladies whom Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so proud of and was so supporting. Moving on, we would move now to talk about Sayyidina Uwais al-Qarni. Sayyidina Uwais uh, عن, was born in the city of Ib in Yemen. And he lived during the, the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And although he lived during the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he never physically met him. So he is not counted among the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because the companion, by definition, is someone who lived during the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who saw him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even for a few seconds, and who died as a Muslim. So two of these uh, conditions, two of these three conditions were uh, um, actually fulfilled in the, in the uh, uh, case of Uwais al-Qarni, but the third one, which is the more, uh, what, um, very important, did not. So he was at the time of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he died as a Muslim, but he did not see Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So for this, Sayyidina Uwais is classified as a tabi'i. And I intended to talk today about him to end our series of companions with a tabi'i. But what, what tabi'i? The tabi'i is a person who saw a sahabi, a companion of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he is a tabi'i and he is known as khayru tabi'in, the best of the tabi'in. He is also known as sayyidu tabi'in fi zamani, the, the leader of the tabi'in of his era. So Uwais grew up in Yemen. And when he was very young, his father died. He therefore had to take care of his mother. He also had leprosy. And Weiss, with his uh, devoted heart and sincere supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, answered, answered his du'a. Allah said, Du'uni astajib lakum. Ask me and I will forgive and I will answer your call. So he, he asked sincerely that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would cure him. So what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured him except for, so Allah healed him and left just a coin-sized piece of disfigured skin on his shoulder. SubhanAllah. So it, every time Wais looked at this small patch, he was reminded of God's favor to him. And he would thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a big lesson for us. Whenever you have a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina Muhammad, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wala in shakartum la azidannakum. If you thank me, then I will increase my favors. So this is what all pious people do. We have something good. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we always acknowledge that we do not know how to thank you, Ya Allah, enough. 
اللهم إنا لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك We don't know how to thank you, Ya Allah We don't know how to thank you the way you deserve to be thanked So, uh, as I mentioned, Wais uh, took care of his mom after the death of his father and unfortunately she went blind and that and with this she became even more dependent on her son so Wais and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam never met because Wais stayed in yemen taking care of his mother so he sacrificed the chance of reaching the rank of companions of the Prophet وسلم, in effort to take care of his elderly mother. Imagine this. But despite this, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, mentioned Uwais to a group of his companions until they asked, Ya Rasulullah, are we going to meet him? But he said, no, only Omar and Ali are coming to meet him. So in one of the gatherings, he was talking about uh, Sayyidina Wais, and he said, there is a man, this is the uh, words of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said, there is a man who will come to you from Yemen. He comes from Murad, the tribe of Quran. And the prophet went on talking about the leprosy that uh, uh, Wais had and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala healed, healed him uh, except for a coin size. And he, he, uh, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, uh, finished the description of Wais saying, and he has a mother. He treats her extremely well and he is obedient to her. Then he said, if Wais al-Qarni takes an oath by God, God will surely honor that oath. If you meet him, looking, this is looking to Sayyidina uh, Umar, if you meet him, ask him to seek forgiveness for you. Now imagine Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling Sayyidina Umar to ask this person to invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Sayyidina Umar never forgot this advice. And when he became the leader of the Muslims, when he became the Khalifa of the Muslims, every year he would go out to meet those groups coming from Yemen to do the pilgrimage, to perform Hajj. And Umar would ask, is Uwais al-Qarni among you? And the answer would be no. And this continued for years and years and years. And finally, in one year, someone from Yemen was asked by Sayyidina Umar, is Wais, Wais with you? And that person looked at him, at Sayyidina Umar, and he said, do you mean that man who, who is uh, taking care of the uh, uh, sheep and animals that we have, we bring him with us? So he said, yeah, he, he might be that person. So Umar went straight to Uwais to determine if he was the Uwais that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he asked him, are you Uwais al-Qarni? And he said, yes. Umar continued, from Murad, the tribe of the Quran? He said, yes. And Umar then asked, were you once afflicted with leprosy and your skin healed except for an area of your shoulder the size of a coin? And Uwais said, yes. And Umar finally asked, do you have a mother that you respect, honor, and take care of? And he said, yes. Then Umar 
explained two ways that the prophet advised him to ask so uh, to ask ways to seek forgiveness from god uh, for, for him so ways did and he asked sayyidna umar uh, that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would uh, uh, he asked sayyidna umar to ask allah for forgiveness he was so humble so now the uh, meeting ended finished and uh, Sayyidina Uwais was heading to Kufa. Sayyidina Umar told him, shall I write a letter to the wali, or the, to the governor of uh, Kufa so that he would help you? And he said, no, I, I prefer, I want to be anonymous. He doesn't want to be known. He wants to keep his relationship with Allah and with Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Though he hadn't seen him, he wanted to keep that secret. Now, imagine. Imagine how important to be good to the parents. Sayyidina Uwais did not meet Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he didn't want to leave his mother and go to, to uh, see Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was taking care of her. When he, when he had the chance to go to see Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he packed his stuff, but he got the news that Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. So imagine how important to be good to the parents is. In Ayah 23 of Surah Al-Isra, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala shows us clearly how our relation to our parents should be. He says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. وقضى ربك ألا تعبدوا إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا إما يبلغن عندك الكبار أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تقل لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما And your Lord has decreed that you not worship except him وقضى ربك ألا تعبدوا إلا إياه And to parents good treatment. You have to be good to your parents. Whether one or both of them reach old age while with you, say not to them. Oof. Imagine how this word is, it, it has three letters. Hamza, fa, fa. Oof. So if they ask you for something and say, I'll do it later. Oof, you have so many qu uh, qu requests. Oof. No, even this word, do not say it. And do not repel them, but speak to them a noble word. This is the, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want us to, to, to deal with our parents. There are many ayahs in the Quran that show shows the children how uh, how to take care of their parents, how to respect them, to be kind to them, to say nice words to them. But there is not a single ayah to direct parents to be good to their children. Why? Because this happens naturally. But the children sometimes forget. And sometimes feel that their parents are way too old-fashioned school. Their ideas are old. They are not up to date. And they start to have ill feelings towards their, their parents. Especially when the parents get old. When they get sick. They would be so frustrated uh, that they are taking care of them. Uh, they are taking their time. They cannot fulfill, the, 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 uh, they cannot do their jobs. 
and they would not be able to take care of them. So what do they do? They put them in nursing uh, homes, in aging homes. Is this the reward that the parents deserve when they get older? Don't the children know that one day they will get old and the children would, their children would do the same to them? Life is but a wheeling chair. It's a turning wheel. So normally, children would wake up after it's too late, after the parents die. They would feel sorry. They would feel that they have not uh, fulfilled their duties to their parents. They would, they would wish that they were better children to their parents. Now, the parents are dead. Does this mean that uh, children are done? No. More duties are there towards them. Until the child himself die, the duty towards the parents is still there, is still their duty, but it will be of a different type. In their graves, the parents would be waiting for the dua of their children. So this would be a valuable gift from the, from the children to their parents after the death, dua. And Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it. يَنْقَطِعُ إِذَا مَاتَ بْنُ آدَمَ يَنْقَطِعُ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ وَلَدٌ صَالِحٌ يَدْعُو لَهُ وَلَدٌ صَالِحٌ A righteous child that make dua. It might not be just a child if they don't have children, but someone who, who loves them make dua. So make dua. You need to be of this category that Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about, talked about. He said, وَلَدٌ صَالِحٌ يَدْعُوا لَهُ A righteous, a good, a good child that would make dua for the deceased parents. Do a continuous charity for them. Help with building a masjid. Help digging a well. Help teaching people Quran. So help by giving some money. When you, when you help with building a masjid, even if it's just very little amount you are giving, have the intention that this, this reward would be for the sake of my, my parents. And the list is endless of the good deeds that you can do to reward your parents after their death. So if you failed them in this dunya while they, they were alive, you can still do something beneficial for them while they are in their graves. Be good to your parents, whether they are alive or dead. Why sacrifice the chance of reaching to the rank of companions of the Prophet in effort to take care of his elderly mother? Do not belittle this role of you towards your parents. Treat them the way you want your children to treat you when you get older. So this is how Uwais took care of his mother. And there are many traditions and stories about Uwais radiallahu anhu. All of them highlight his humbleness and simple living. And reading the stories of Uwais prompt us to ask ourselves, how did Uwais attain such a high status that even the companions were told to seek forgiveness from him, to ask Allah, to, to, for forgiveness for them. How? How did he attain this position? How is he elevated so to this high station? Two reasons. The first one, he was dutiful to his mother and he also suffered 
The second, so the second reason, he suffered from a chronic condition that severely affected his, his life. But he was patient. So two things you can do to be elevated. Be good to your parents and be patient and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all afflictions that you have in life. Life is nothing but a test. We have to be patient and we have to pass this test. We trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that the reward will be so high in the, in the day after. So Awais was, known, was always known to be devoted, to be a devo the most devoted, biased Muslim. He had immense love to Allah and to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he earned uh, the, this high uh, uh, position and he earned the praise of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said, رب أشعث أغبر مدفوع بالأبواب لو أقسم على الله لأبره. Many a person with disheveled hair, untidy hair, dusty, and driven away from doors because of his poverty and because of his shabby clothes, were to swear by Allah that something would happen and Allah will certainly make it happen. This was Sayyidina Uwais. So, when we have a close relation to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we would be like Uwais Al-Qarni. He believed in Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He did not see him. We believed in Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we did not see him. He was on the right path of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always guide us to be on the path of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our bond with Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And to be as those whom he, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, want to be in this dunya. He wants us to be of good characters, of good manners. And he promised, he said to us, The closest of you to me on the day of judgment are those who have good manners. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to guide us to have good manners to show us the way of being of those who have the good manners. So this was Sayyidina Uwais radiallahu anhu. And at the end, I say that the character of Uwais is a character that every believer should strive to emulate. Uwais Qarni's story sets an example for all the Muslims as how even without meeting Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one may stay earn Allah's favor and his pleasure. One can stay connected to Allah and to his prophet. So this is uh, what, uh, uh, with this character, with this female, com uh, with this male companion and female companion that we talked about today, this would be the last session of this series in which we talked about male and female companions of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we ended with a tabi'i, someone who did not see Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but. He is praised by Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So all these characters that we covered are amazing examples of the true Muslim characters that every believer should strive to emulate. So their stories were not stories. What we covered was not just to, ha to, to, to have some good time uh, reading stories. No. We learn from the lessons of these stories. We learn from, from them. Uh, uh, and, and these stories are just to enlighten our path just to show us that if we follow the path that the companions uh, followed, then we will be with Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the, the, their stories and the lessons we learned from them are to enlighten our path and to help us be of those whom Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said about them. In many, many positions in the Quran. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. Allah is pleased of their, uh, Allah is pleased with their actions, with what they, with what they did. Allah is pleased with them for their being pious, honest, truthful, for, for having good manners. And in turn, they are pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when, when, uh, when they will uh, enjoy the unlimited reward and blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows on them on the day after. What he has prepared for them. In the second eternal life, they are pleased with that. So we want to be of this group. We want to be of these people whom Allah is pleased with them. And we want to raise a gen generation that would be coolness of an eye to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So with this, I thank you all for attending and for listening to this series. And I ask you all to include me and my family in your du'as. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us and make all our deeds sincere and pure for his sake. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always enlighten our path and our hearts. And may, he, may Allah give us the best of ending وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته